Oak clenches his fists. Surprised they didn't show a photo of him breastfeeding and call him a tit-biting madman. They also ran a front-page story claiming his mother had said he'd be better off dead. And this kind of coverage hadn't gone unnoticed by a certain Raoul Moat. He left a dictaphone message for police claiming to be upset by the coverage and threatening to kill a member of the public in exchange for each inaccurate report. A bit like an armed extremist wing of the Press Complaints Commission. As a result, the police requested a media blackout on stories relating to Moat's private life. Which left the news with even less inane speculation to string out, because there was still no sign of the man himself. Jeremy Thompson was reduced to hanging around in the undergrowth with a tracker, foraging for bullshit. He didn't find Moat, but he did find some traces of Moat, or possibly litter. It was hard to say. From here, I can already see a recently discarded Argos carrier bag. God, I bet that Argos bag would look amazing on Sky News HD. Thankfully for everyone's sanity, things came to a head on a balmy Friday evening as Moat was spotted on the outskirts of Rothbury. Stiff rule following police immediately warned residents to stay in their homes, but the reporters ignored that in favour of creating an impromptu media carnival in the middle of the high street. The coverage soon showed people pouring out to see what was going on and occasionally wave at their relatives back home. Speaking of relatives, the BBC's John Sobel encouraged a woman visibly upset that her mum was in the sealed off area to ring her live on air, even telling her how to operate the phone to do it. Can you put your mum on the speakerphone? That's a bit impersonal. <laughs> Good job she didn't have an iPhone. He'd ask for a go on Angry Birds next. Can I have a quick word with her? Can the guy speak to you? Hi. Hi, how, how are you doing? Moat, we learned, was lying down with a gun pointed at his head, but the news couldn't quite see that from where they were standing. Reporters tweeted that they were trying to get close but were prevented from doing so. Instead, they had to make do with broadcasting photos of some pissed-off-looking marksmen. So finally, they got what they'd come for. Although rather than getting images, they captured audio of Moat's shotgun going off, which they inevitably played again and again and again, even cranking the volume because it was important we should hear it. Listen to it again, we're going to really push these levels for you. you now, I think they all pushed it on all sorts of levels. Also in July, the big society got a hand in the form of Channel 4's fairy job mother, a.k.a. Hayley Taylor, a sort of super nanny state. She was an off-the-peg troubleshooting telebody who preempted the government's bullying of the bone idol by several months. The format was simple, find some feckless, jobless people who seemed unemployable and then get the fairy job mother to drag them out of the demotivating benefit trap and onto the meaningless wage slave treadmill. The targets of the programme's advice seemed more depressed than anything, but that was overshadowed by a blizzard of patronising empowerment exercises. Right, I want to talk you through this. We're on this journey, yeah? Hopefully, leading off far into the distance and over there's a job, OK? But at the moment, we're here. Apparently, the best way to make someone grow up and take responsibility for themselves is to treat them like they're four. Good morning. My name's Dean Peterson, made for the 10 o'clock interview. Well done! Cinema in 2010 was dominated by the need to wear these things, 3D glasses. The craze really came into its own, of course, with the ultra-successful Avatar, a visually spectacular epic about a tribe of sanctimonious blue wankers selfishly attempting to halt mankind's progress for the sake of a poxy tree. I don't know if you saw it, but it was basically the equivalent of having a smurf on a stick shoved in your face for three hours. Not that 3D was confined to cinemas. Sky launched a 3D TV service so viewers could experience the crushing mundanity of their programmes in three dimensions, with Sky News helpfully showing how it worked with graphics that weren't at all misleading. Technology continued its dominance over mankind throughout 2010, but it wasn't all plain sailing. First, in a thrilling online press conference, Steve Jobs unveiled the iPad, which aimed to revolutionise the way mankind stroked overpriced rectangles forever. And as if that wasn't enough, Apple also unleashed the iPhone 4, a device so advanced the human hand was almost too old-fashioned to use it. Video games continued their ongoing renaissance with superb titles such as the sprawling western epic Red Dead Redemption, happy-go-lucky platform action in the dreamlike Super Mario Galaxy 2, unhappy-go-lucky indie platform action in the nightmarish Limbo, handheld physics fun with the seemingly ubiquitous ubiquitous Angry Birds and ghoulish interactive movie shenanigans in the cinematic Heavy Rain, which included an astonishing sequence in which you had to make your character cut one of his own fingers off via a method of your choosing. I've gone for pliers. <laughs> of course, I'm so desensitised to violence, I can just play this while having a snack. You have three minutes and 30 seconds left. But games weren't all nasty, some were so charming they could only be advertised by lovable boy band Jalus. What's really interesting about this advert is that it graphically simulates how it might look if JLS held a wanking contest. <laughs> yes! Yes! 
One day in August, Britain woke up to footage of a woman putting a cat in a bin. These tragic images dismayed everyone. And it's really sad because it's a rescue cat, so it's had its fair share of trauma. Mm -hmm. And now this happens. The footage had been posted on the internet. Before long, it went global. A woman in England has caused quite a controversy after dumping a cat into the trash. Round and round the world, it went being shown again and again and again in different languages. But with a similar reaction everywhere. Then she opens up that garbage right. bin right there. Oh, and, no, 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 no. And no, dumps no. a cat right in there. No. The first thing everyone wanted to know was who was this woman? The woman we showed you last night dropping a cat into a wheelie bin has been identified. But her motive hasn't. Yes, as Alistair Stewart had somberly indicated, Cat Bin Lady's motives were a mystery to everyone. I mean, why would you do that? Why would you put a cat in a bin? Why is she doing this? I mean, why? Why is she doing this? Why? Why is she doing it? Why put a cat in a bin? I mean, why? Why do it? Why? Seriously, why? Why? I mean, why? Eventually, the news had her cornered, and all they wanted to know was why. Why would you do it, Mary? People might just understand, Mary, if you just tell us. Yes, we might understand. Just tell us. Just, to, just tell us. Uh, we, we know why, you. Why did you do this, though? Yeah, why did you do it, though? Can you just tell us why you did what you did? Just tell us why you did what you did. Mary, if you just speak to us for a few seconds, we can go away. You know, actually, I can't help thinking there isn't really going to be an explanation that's going to satisfy everyone. And sure enough, she eventually issued a statement saying she could not explain her actions. And so our world was left revolving in the cold, dark universe, knowing only two things. One, that there are some cruelties that can never be adequately explained. And two, that we are all alone. Not as alone as a cat in a bin, but alone. When the, uh, when the X Factor came on, all glitzy like, they'd done this really clever thing, right? Because usually, when the audition lot are singing, even the good ones aren't as good as like proper stars, like, you know, Leona Lewis or JLS or something. But this year, they used a computer to make them sound like sort of electric space people, like if Robocop was singing at a wedding. Just a city boy, and what was really good was the shit ones who got laughed at didn't have the false voice thing for them. So when you were laughing at them, you knew you were really laughing at, like, the very core of their being, you know, cackling at their souls. Loads of people moaned about it, but what they didn't get was that the X Factor had to make the good ones sound good with a computer, cos otherwise they might have sounded shit. And that wouldn't have made sense, because the judges put them through. I mean, think about it. I mean, how are you meant to know they're a good singer if they keep it in wrong notes? September and Sky News began triumphantly trailing a forthcoming showbiz extravaganza. More than four million fans in the UK. Lady Gaga. First tour in 28 years. Mark Bolan. Glasgow, London, Birmingham. Status quo. The Pope is coming. Live coverage on Sky News HD. Yes, superb and exhaustive full-colour news coverage depicted the ghost of Ernie Wise futting round the regions in a vertical hearse with the windows up in case a protester threw a condom or a choir boy at him. Look how he's got one! The Popesicle played several expertly covered stadium gigs, including this one where his support acts were Susan Boyle doing her hit I Dreamed a Dream and Our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it's nice to see Jesus going down so well. Last time they crucified him. The event was a dream to dream come true for Subo, who'd always wanted to meet an internationally revered messianic embodiment of hope other than Simon Cowell. What did the Pope say to you? I just kissed his ring. Well, I hope you brushed your teeth. September also saw two brothers join together in a desperate struggle for survival, a sort of human milliband. Action Miliband and My Little Miliband went up against Edney Spheres, Formica Man and the Nutty Professor to win the leadership of the only party not running the country. In a surprise finish, Baby Miliband emerged victorious thanks to the sort of voting process that could confuse the guy who solved Fermat's last theorem. As ITN depicted in revealing scenes, Ed seemed more relieved than pleased to have come first. They just spend a few moments now watching Ed Miliband's face at the climactic moment. Here is God, do I have to? In the aftermath, the news seemed more interested in staring at David to see if he'd suddenly hulk out and start smashing stuff up in a fury. 
but disappointingly he didn't crack apart from a Katia side. Turning to Harriet Harman, he appears to ask her angrily, you voted for it, why are you clapping? Which left the news having to explain who this new dweeb was. As ITN showed us, he was a, a man. A man who'd once been a comedy nerd behind Gordon Brown, but now was like all important and stuff. He's the British public don't know you that well. What Sorry, sort of leader, leader are you going to be? Uh, I, I, I will be a leader please? who, in the first instance, Sorry, is a responsible leader of the opposition. No, it's going to be a boring one. Another contest with a shocking twist took place in Australia as the 400th series of Next Top Model shuddered to a climax in a live spectacular announcing the winner. It's you, Kelsey. Yeah!